So the last thing we want to talk about here as far as linear momentum goes is the whole concept of conservation of momentum and energy. So this is a device called a Newton's Cradle. And you can find some interesting videos of Newton's Cradle if you do a search on YouTube. But the idea here is I have five spheres hanging and they're all in line. So here's sphere number one and it's going to swing down and strike sphere number two and it's going to impart its momentum just before it comes in. It has some velocity v and so the mass of one times the velocity of one and all spheres have identical masses. So the momentum of mass one is mv. It strikes and it hits m2 so that's going to have a momentum mv. That strikes sphere three gives it the momentum mv. That strikes sphere four gives it the momentum mv. And finally, sphere 5 gets hit, and it swings up with an initial velocity of v, same velocity that sphere number 1 had. So the velocity of 1 coming in equals the velocity of 5 going out. Momentum is conserved. In a similar fashion, the kinetic energy of 1 is going to equal the kinetic energy of 5. Okay, not a big deal. Identical masses. But what would happen if two spheres were sitting up here, so number one and number two, and they come down and they hit. So now I have two mv, and that's going to strike three, which strikes four and five. Now what happens is four and five move out with the same velocity, so two m times the same velocity. So the velocity of one and two coming in equals the velocity of four and five going out. No problem. That conserves momentum. But why not have one and two come in, so two m come in with velocity one, two, and just have sphere five go out all on its own? In that scenario, remember all the masses are the same, the velocity of five would equal twice the velocity of one and two. But if I do that, what we discover is that the kinetic energy before, the kinetic energy coming in, which is 1 half 2m times v squared, v is the same as v12, that would be transformed into 1 half m times twice that velocity squared, because v5 is going out with twice the velocity. Well, here I'm going to have m v squared, but over here, I have 4v squared times 1 half m, which is 2mv squared. There's a gain in kinetic energy. That can't happen. There's no place in here for energy to be picked up. The only exception might be if I had a spring or something inside of here, some sort of an energy source. could be a small explosive. Then that might work. Otherwise, conservation of energy does not allow sphere 5 to move up with twice the velocity. All right, let's move on to discuss angular momentum. We will define angular momentum about point 0 or about point O, the origin, with an h, and it's going to equal the position of an object with respect to O crossed with the mass times velocity of the object. So it's position cross momentum. Now we must remember vector cross products. So if you go back a few chapters and we discuss cross products, the magnitude of the angular momentum equals the component of the position perpendicular to the momentum vector or the length from O to wherever the object is times mass times the component of the velocity perpendicular to the position vector. I can also use my determinant format h o equals i j k r sub x r sub y r sub z m v sub x m v sub y m v sub z m v sub z determinants. That will also help me find the angular momentum. Now the time derivative of angular momentum, so here it is, the time derivative is equal to the derivative of the cross product. So I use the product rule. Derivative of the first, which is the derivative of the position vector crossed with mv, plus the position vector crossed with 
mass times the derivative of velocity with respect to time. But r dot is v, and v cross mv, v is parallel to itself. Two vectors that are parallel have a cross product of zero. And so that first term goes away. And all I'm left with is r cross ma. But you recall from statics, that's equal to the moment about point O. So the derivative of angular momentum is equal to moment. Well, you may recall moment is the angular counterpart to force. All right, so the same concepts hold true here. If there are no external moments, then angular momentum is conserved. If this is equal to zero, the derivative with respect to time of the angular momentum is equal to zero if the sum of the external moments is zero. Here's my initial angular momentum, HO. Then I add to that any moments integrated with respect to time. That's the angular impulse. That will be the final angular momentum about point O. So the angular impulse equals the integral from time 1 to time 2 of the moment about O at the vector quantity dt. That will equal the final angular momentum minus the initial angular momentum about O. But if the angular impulse is zero, the net angular momentum will not change. Keep in mind, there could be lots of different particles here. Each individual particle might have a change in angular momentum, but the net angular momentum will remain unchanged. And again, remember that angular moment is R cross F. So, conservation of angular momentum, if the external, external angular impulse is zero, the angular momentum before and after will remain unchanged. So here's a really prime example. You can take a moment or two to read this. The main idea is I have a sphere A coming in with a velocity of 12 meters per second in the I direction. So this is I hat and there's J hat. The masses of A, B, and C are identical. We'll set those at 7.5 kilograms. But D down here, so A, B, and C have the same mass. D, however, has a mass of 15 kilograms. So we might just look at this, and by anti-symmetry, if you will, A comes in, strikes B. D is kind of slow and big. We would anticipate this object is going to rotate a little bit about point D. So there's a collision taking place. Now we know that after the impact, A and B have velocities of 2.5 meters per second, strictly in the I direction. And we know that C also is moving strictly in the I direction. Now that's only immediately after the impact. And so is D. What we're interested in are those values for C and for D. What are those speeds? And then how much kinetic energy is lost? So to solve this problem, I'm going to begin first by conserving angular momentum about D. So here's point D. A is the only thing moving, so there's the position of A. But remember, the angular momentum is R perpendicular times MV, and MV is in this direction. So the component of the position, no matter where A is in this movement, the component of the position is right there, 0 0.9 meters. So the angular momentum about D previous to the collision is equal to 0 0.9 meters times the mass, which is 7.5 kilograms, times 12 meters per second. What direction is it in? Well, recall it's R cross MV. R is in the J hat direction, positive J hat. MV is in the I hat direction. I don't know if you know the IJK circle. We go, if you don't know the IJK circle, you go from I to J in the counterclockwise. J to K in the counterclockwise, K to I in the counterclockwise. So J cross I, J cross I is in the wrong direction. J cross I then gives me K, but since it's in the wrong direction, this must equal minus K. K, keep in mind, is coming out of the board. So this angular momentum is negative K direction, or clockwise, the negative K direction is the clockwise direction. So that's the angular momentum 
previous to the collision about point D. Now after the collision, I know that A and B are moving together at two and a half meters per second. And so I get about point D, A and B are both 0 0.9 meters. So 0 0.9 meters, 7.5 kilograms, 2.5 meters per second. Both of them to the right, that's clockwise. And there's two of them. I also know that C is moving with some velocity to the right. And notice C is 1.8 meters above point D. So 1.8 meters, 7.5 kilograms, times the velocity of C. That's also going to be clockwise. So both of those are in the clockwise direction. Finally, the angular momentum of D. D is a distance of zero from itself. And so that would be zero meters. 15 kilograms times the velocity of D. So that term actually just goes away. So you can see that what we've now done is allowed ourselves to solve for the velocity of C. I still don't know the velocity of D, but I now know the velocity of C. Because I'm going to take this term and set it equal to these terms. So for the left-hand side, I get minus 81 kilogram meters squared per second. For the right-hand side, I get minus 33.75 kilogram meters squared per second, minus 13.5 kilogram meters times V sub C. All of these are in the K direction, or the clockwise direction. And if I solve that correctly, I got V sub C equals 3.5 meters per second. Now that's just C. What about D? In order to solve for D, I can do the same problem, only now... I'm going to do the angular momentum about point C. All right, so the angular momentum before the collision is going to be 0 0.9 meters. That's the position. Remember, only A is moving, times 7.5 kilograms, times 12 meters per second. And the position is in the minus J hat direction, and the velocity is in the I hat direction. So again, I have J cross I. So J cross I is still K in the wrong direction, so minus k. But I have a minus sign here, so this will be in the positive k direction. So now I get positive 81 kilogram meter squared per second in the counterclockwise direction. And then as I look at A after the collision, remember nobody's moving before the collision except for A. After the collision, A and B are moving together. So that's 0 0.9 meters, 7.5 kilograms, 2.5 meters per second. Both of those are positive, so times 2. So again, I have 33.75 kilogram meters squared per second. That's also counterclockwise. As far as the velocity of C, the position from C to itself is 0, so that's going to have no component of angular momentum. But then I have D, and that's going to be 1.8 meters, 15 kilograms, times the velocity of D, and that's to the right. And so again, that's going to be counterclockwise. So we have 27 kilogram meters times the velocity of D, also counterclockwise. And so 81 kilogram meters squared per second equals 33.75 kilogram meters squared per second plus 27 kilogram meters V sub D, and so I get 47.25 kilogram meters squared per second equals 27 kilogram meters V sub D. And just to kind of keep my units all around, divide both sides by 27 kilogram meters, and I get 1.75 kilograms go away. This meter cancels one of those meters per second, which of course is a velocity, so that all makes perfect sense. And finally, to calculate the kinetic energy, I have one half 7.5 kilograms times 12 meters per second squared. That's before, so that's 540 joules. Then I have one half 7.5 kilograms times 2.5 meters per second. That's A and B, so we'll just multiply that by 2. 46.875 joules, and I have one half 7.5 kilograms. The velocity of C was 3.5 meters per second. Square that, 45.9375 joules. 
And finally, one half, 15 kilograms. This is D. So this was A and B. This was C. And this is D. Times 1.75 meters per second. 22.96875 joules. I add all these together. I get 115.78125 joules. Subtract that from the 540, and I lost approximately 424 joules. Or alternatively, I could say about 21.4% remains. And I get that by taking 115.78125 divided by 540 and turning that into a percentage.